I just wanted to talk briefly about terminology in psychiatry. Um, so my story goes back about five or six years to when I was a medical student uh, getting my first taste of psychiatry on an inpatient unit uh, in Brisbane. And the first thing that stood out in my mind uh, from that experience was not interacting with profoundly psychotic patients. It wasn't uh, dealing with suicidally depressed people. It was actually some of the, the words that people were using. Um, so I kept hearing uh, the word consumer and client and turned out that they were referring to the patients. This struck me as quite odd. I had worked on uh, different units uh, before uh, in the hospital as a student and obviously they were always referred to as either patient or that name. But all of a sudden in the psychiatric unit, uh, people refused to use the word patient, it seemed. And when I looked into it, I found it wasn't just an isolated case for this hospital. Um, it seems that it's a growing trend um, also in the United Kingdom and the United States, and indeed over the last uh, couple of decades at least. Um, and people ascribe to this terminology because they believe that it reflects a desire to alter patients' uh, perceived relationship with uh, their carers, with the doctors, and with their treatment. Um, and so the medical profession, or I guess psychiatry, wants to remove the idea of uh, dependency and suffering uh, in psychiatric care, and they want people to uh, take it upon themselves to help themselves. Not using the word patient uh, and opting for consumer and client seems to reflect th this desire. When I looked into the history of these uh, terms, it seems like they can be traced back to uh, what can be known as the psychiatry survivors movement. So this movement arose primarily out of the 1960s and 1970s, the civil rights uh, movements. So other things that we had at the time were women's rights uh, movements, we had the gay rights movements, the disability rights movements. Um, and so there was these organisations that were coming up, um, like the Insane uh, Liberation Front and the Network Against Psychiatric Assault. And these organisations were headed by people who had been psychiatric patients themselves. And so they protested through testimonies of their own, of their own mistreatment. And these people weren't just calling for reform of a... Uh, psychiatric system, many actually challenge the fundamental claims and practice of psychiatry itself. So these activists saw themselves, as did other rights movements at the time, as humanists. So they were protecting, protecting the vulnerable from an inhumane society and an inhumane system. So the psychiatric system at the time seemed to be causing a loss of freedom and dignity uh, through involuntary treatment orders. Uh, they misuse seclusion and restraints. Um, it seemed to be a system that was inflicting uh, needless neurological damage via you know, poorly administered drugs and uh, poorly administered electroconvulsive therapy or shock therapy. And so it seemed like there, was, there were these harmful treatments that appeared to evolve more guesswork than science and for which evidence was marginal at best. Um, so these people want to take the power back in this sort of situation. One thing that I want to bring up is, you know, there's, in many of these rights movements, they, people can look back to a key text that helped uh, motivate people. Um, and for psychiatry, it was a book by uh, Judy Chamberlain. And so that was written in 1978. Um, and it was called On Our Own. So I just want to um, read out a portion of the text. For all the people confined in psychiatric institutions against their will, for all the people confined in group homes and congregate living facilities, for all the people confined by the internal walls of forced drugging, for all the people confined by the lost memories and broken brains of electroshock, I say, we will not wait. Our struggle is being fought today on many fronts by many brave people who want nothing more than the chance to live our potentials, to take chances, to succeed, to fail, to try to have opportunities, to make mistakes, to achieve, to change our minds, to be foolish, 
to pursue our dreams. Um, so the key terms here that we should notice are ones of uh, disempowerment and loss. So um, there were terms like um, confined and uh, against their will, force, loss, broken, and struggle. Um, and then there are also terms of uh, you know, humanizing qualities. So there were terms such as uh, live and potential, dreams, chances, succeed, try, opportunities. Um, so I think this is what patients wanted. So they wanted to have more autonomy, so they wanted more rights and the ability to choose their own treatment or lack of treatment. Um, and they wanted an empathic or a compassionate mental health system that viewed them as humans. And so words such as consumer and client and things like that were really born out of this time when autonomy and compassion were really lacking in the system. So these people were essentially saying, we don't unequivocally accept the claims and practices of psychiatry. Um, we don't accept being a patient of psychiatry. And if we want help, we will seek it on our own terms. So these terms have persisted since then, but obviously um, I'm not the only one who's questioned how valid uh, these alternate terms are. So there's been a number of studies that have looked into this and the results are not conclusive by any means. Um, and so there was, there's one that I want to point out, but I'll put in a link to some other studies uh, below. So there was a study done by a UK psychiatrist, his name was uh, Peter Simmons. And so interestingly, participants were asked to give comments as well as uh, their scores. And I just wanted to pick a few out here. Um, so one patient said, I believe addiction is an illness. If I was in with cancer, I would expect to be called a cancer patient. So what is the difference? Uh, another one said, I believe the word user is inappropriate and would make people feel bad about being here. Uh, another one uh, said, I see mental health problems in the same way as physical problems and therefore being called a patient is appropriate for both. So, um, and as I said, there's a number of other studies and um, whether patient ranks first or second, um, it, it seems to you know change a little bit. But um, what's certain is that patience isn't the unanimously disliked term by any means. So at best, the preference for these replacement terms are equivocal and they make a little difference. But at worst, patients dislike uh, the other terms. But I think it's important to note that patient preference isn't the only thing that we should be taking into account. Um, and we should think about other implications about using uh, this sort of language. So I think the first big one is, if nothing else, a consumer implies uh, that you consume. So a consumer consumes. So you would eat up, you devour, you gorge, you gobble, you feast, you expend. Um, and so when used in the context of health resources, how easily could this translate to an inflamed uh, perceived burden? Uh, so you're consuming resources here. So you're consuming money and you're consuming hospital beds, you're consuming uh, professionals' times. Um, and then when you add to this the resistant and relapsing nature of mental illnesses um, that leave you know, a lot of this treatment, uh, I guess, seemingly futile, uh, this, this puts the, the, the patient population in uh, quite a precarious position. Um, and then you can add on top of this the unwillingness of many patients to engage in this treatment. Um, I, we have to remember here that psychiatric illness affects the same organ that can perceive uh, that illness and consent for its treatment and things like that. So in, one, in times of worldwide economic uh, stress and difficulties, governments are continually looking at ways to uh, cut back on spending, save money, save dollars here and there. So why should governments be wasting their precious dollars on these so-called consumers? And so terms such as consumer and clients and service users and things like that, they also invoke uh, notions of a market relationship. So 
they appear to discount the fact that these people, or psychiatric patients, are suffering from an illness that requires treatment. So a consumer is persuaded to purchase you know, a product uh, via convincing marketing um, or as a luxury because they want to. But a patient uh, is, well, to be a patient is a right, I guess. So a patient deserves the right to health care, but it does a client or a consumer. And then another problem, I think, is that having a, specially, a special term for the mentally ill uh, in hospitals further segregates them from all other patients uh, in healthcare. So it's no secret how differently our society treats people suffering from mental illness. Um, combating stigma uh, is a huge project uh, for all psychiatrists, all doctors, indeed everyone in society. But we seem to be continually undermining this if we, on one hand, try to convince people that mental illnesses are indeed real. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, we give psychiatric patients or people with psychiatric illness a different name to everyone else in the medical health care system. Um, and so this is, I mean, it's an odd irony. The, these terms have been brought in to help empower mental health patients uh, to reduce stigma of someone who's suffering independent. Um, but it seems to be inadvertently strengthening uh, these things. So I, I think the, the take home message for me is that to be a patient is a concept. It's a concept that's steeped in centuries of medical history and societal conventions. Um, and I think that changing the term merely transfers these concepts. But worse still, these substitute terms that we're transferring these concepts onto can also have uh, more damaging effects themselves. So what should we do? Well, I think that firstly, we should recognize that terms consumer and user um, and client are not magic bullets, uh, but they're band-aid solutions at best. Um, and they're very poor ones at that. But then secondly, acknowledge not only the terms ineffective, but why did they come into use in the first place? So they came at a time when patients were looking for more autonomy, they were looking for more rights, and they were looking for, for more compassion uh, from a mental health care system that was seen to be uh, inhumane um, and, uh, I guess, unscientific. Um, and so these are the things that we really need to, to work on. Uh, they're not going to be changed uh, just by changing the name. Um, and I believe that we should uh, stop being scared of the term patient uh, and go back to using it uh, and treating people with psychiatric illness just as we would for any other medical condition. Um, so uh, I hope that helps. Uh, leave some comments uh, below. Uh, this topic seems to uh, spark up a bit of debate um, and that's what I want to do, spark some, uh, some conversation. Uh, so please get involved and until next time. Thanks.